With the second pick in the 2020 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Chase Young, defensive end, Ohio State. But you know as they say, hail to the Redskins. Let's roll, man. Let's go. Uh, I want to go through the defensive ends on the roster right now. Currently, the Redskins have eight defensive ends on the roster. I think when it's all said and done, that number is going to be trimmed down to either four or five. Um, I think it could get as high as five, but no less than four. So it's one or the other. You know, if they're keeping five, I think it's an easy decision. If you're keeping four, that's when things get a little dicey, if you ask me. But when you look at this list of players, um, I'm, I'm excited about it. I haven't been this excited about the defensive line in, in forever. Um, I'm going to just be honest with you. Uh, even with the Greg Williams defensive teams, we didn't have a, a defensive line that scared anybody, you know. Um, so this is this is a different group here. This is something unlike we've seen as Redskins fans in, in close to 30 years. So uh, this is difference. This is difference making right here. Uh, and so we'll start with the guys that I didn't even put on the marquee because uh, they're not going to make the football team. They don't even stand a chance, uh, barring some kind of unforeseen circumstances um, two guys in particular, Ryan B., who we all know um, as a guy that played well in the preseason for us uh, last year and may even have played uh, the last two years in the preseason. But I know for sure last year there was a debate on whether he should make the football team or not. At the end of the day, uh, we're in a position now where a guy like Ryan B. shouldn't be on our roster. Uh, I've said this before. I'll say it again. We're now at the point where we should have enough talent. And I know we're not the most talented team in the league, but no longer should we be one of those teams where a guy that has no business being in the league on an NFL roster, on a, on a 53-man roster at the beginning. Now, a guy like Ryan B. might end up playing because of injuries. It's a war of attrition. Guys go down, and you bring up a guy like Ryan B. from the pack practice squad. That's understandable. But to start off the season, Ryan B. should not be making your 53-man roster, and I don't think he will. Uh, but he's intriguing because of his length and his size at 6'8" you know, and long arms, he's a guy that is very intriguing. But Ryan B is not making a football team. Neither is Cameron Malvo, okay? Uh, so that's another guy that right now is on the roster um, out of Houston, second-year player, can't see any way in which Cameron Malvo makes this football team. And so you just quickly take those two out of the mix and you focus on the final six guys because those are the guys that legitimately have a shot to be on this roster. There are a few locks, and then there are three guys really battling it out for one or two spots. So we'll get to those guys first. And the first guy that I want to talk about is the guy that was drafted in the seventh round, uh, James Smith-Williams out of NC State. Uh, I've given you a thorough breakdown of him, but uh, I'll pull up my notes real quick and talk about James Smith Williams. Uh, for those of you who need a refresher, I need a damn refresher myself because um, I know he dealt with a ton of injuries at NC State, not a lot of production. All of those things ring true to me and ring in the front of my mind, but uh, I still need um, confirmation on some of the other things that I saw from him on tape. So 6'4", 265 pounds. As I mentioned, he looks the part of an NFL defensive end. 34-inch arms, which is ridiculous for an edge rusher. So that's another big coup for him. 4'6 flat. He tore it up at the Senior Bowl, which is where I think he got on the Redskins' radar. I think that's where they fell in love with him and decided that if he was around late in the draft, they were going to uh, take a flyer on him. Um, this is a guy with 28 reps of two and a quarter, which that's very impressive for a guy with 34-inch arms. Normally, when you got longer arms, it's harder to pump that iron. I know that for a fact because I'm a guy uh, with longer arms. And so it, it, it makes it a lot harder for you to get that weight up. You know, shorter arms, quicker up, down, up, down. But long arms, long way to go. And so 28 reps for a guy with those, uh, those kinds of uh, arms, that length, pretty damn impressive. Uh, so for his career, 12 and a half sacks. Uh, or excuse me, eight sacks for his career, 12 and a half tackles for loss. But nine and a half of those 12 and a half tackles for loss came in 2018. And six of his eight career sacks came in 2018. So really he had one year of production at NC State. Um, so um, I put down in my notes real quick, 
exciting physical and mental makeup extremely explosive twitchy mover with closing speed uses its length well at the point of attack and effective bull rush against lesser tackles all right but then his weakness is he doesn't shed blockers after stacking has no moves in his rolodex whatsoever so you're getting a guy that has no rush plan that has no variety i mean if you go to his menu of moves he's got he's got a bull rush and he's got a speed rush i can get that in one combo when i visit his his restaurant Eat that, ha wash it down with a bull rush, and never come back again because there's no more items on the menu. I've tried everything. I don't need to come back. So he doesn't have much in, in the way of getting to the quarterback. Little to no production outside of 2018. I just explained that to you essentially. And then injury concerns. This was the big thing. Uh, you know, I think some teams just probably took him completely off their board because of his injury situation. Um, this was a guy that three out of his five years in college ended his season with season ending injuries that required surgery. So this is a guy that has been battered and bruised and, um, he was 196 pounds when he showed up on the campus at NC state before transforming his body to 265. So, you know, maybe some of that has to do with the fact that, um, his, his body type isn't supposed to be one of 265 pounds, but he created this this body type, and maybe his body is having a hard time adjusting to it. I don't know, but uh, not a lot here with James Smith Williams. So uh, not a guy that I'm all that excited about, but obviously this staff saw something in him that prompted them to pull the trigger on him in the seventh round. So uh, he's not to be dismissed. I want to see him on the field, and I want to see him in action before I, I dismiss him and say that he's not going to make the football team. Because if there are five spots, best believe that he and more likely than not, um, Jordan Brailford would probably be battling it out for that final spot. Um, then you get to the other seventh round pick, but from 2018, or excuse me, 2019 and not the 2020 draft, that being Jordan Brailford. Uh, this was a guy that put up numbers at Oklahoma State, as I mentioned, um, a, a guy that has everything you're looking for, has the size has the athleticism, um, has the ability to bend and dip the, and rip uh, the corner, um, has some juice off the edge. I was excited about him. If you remember my breakdown of Jordan Brailford last draft season, I, I told you I was excited about him. I was looking forward to seeing this guy play, and then he gets injured, and we really don't get to see him at all. So I'm looking forward to seeing him again. And I don't think the injury that he sustained last year was that great to the point where he couldn't have come back. I think the Redskins just didn't want to expose him to waivers because if they cut him, teams would have had a chance to pounce on him. And, and I think they felt like if we um, if we allow this guy to be released and hopefully try to get him to clear waivers to put him on the practice squad, someone's going to scoop him up. And to avoid that, they just put him on IR. I think he had like an ankle sprain. Like it doesn't take you a full year to come back from an ankle sprain. They could have said, hey, Jordan, heal up, you know, and, and we'll, we'll uh, bring you back if they really wanted to. But I think they just, they didn't have a roster spot for him. And so in, instead of risking him um, out on the on waivers, they just put him on IR. So I'm looking forward. It's not like he had a serious injury. I, I'm looking forward to seeing Ken, uh, Jordan Brailford compete. And I think if they're keeping five, that's where that last spot is going to end up going is to, to Jordan Brailford. I really believe that. But you know, if they keep four, then it becomes really interesting because now you got three guys battling for one spot. I've given you two of those guys. The third of that trio would then be Nate Orchard. And Nate Orchard, if you remember, Nate Angry Orchard, all right? Um, if you remember, the reason he's here is because of what he did against Carolina in Carolina that ultimately helped Ron Rivera get fired and land here in D.C. He went nuts against the Carolina Panthers. Uh, remember, he was signed five days before that game. You know, was barely knew anybody's name, no less. You know, the plays or anything. I remember that that third down stop he had against Christian McCaffrey, which if, if not for Nate Orchard on that play, he walks into the end zone. That was a hell of a play by Nate Orchard. He didn't even know where to line up on that play, if you remember. He was walking around and he didn't know. He was trying to tap the guy next to him to find out what the hell his responsibility was. And then he just he lined up 
And I think it was actually that confusion by him and the subsequent not lining up before the snap that really helped him end up being in the right spot at the right time. And he stonewalled Christian McCaffrey at the goal line, dro drove him back, and ultimately saved the game because if he doesn't do that, the Panthers are going to beat us. So um, Nate Orchard had a, a fantastic game. He had two sacks in that game, that game-clinching or saving stop there. Uh, and then remember, he helped along with Chris Odom provide the pressure at the, on that final snap where uh, Kyle Allen ran backwards like 10 yards and then ultimately I think he ended up taking a sack there and the Redskins preserved the victory. So um, Nate Orchard, uh, I think, ended up getting that one-year deal that he signed with the Redskins based off of what they saw from him in that game. Rivera remembered that guy that tore us up. What was his name? And, and Kyle Smith said, oh, you're talking about Nate Orchard. Yeah, bring him back. That guy has some, uh, some juice. He's got a little something off the edge. Bring him back. I want to see that guy. I want to see more of him. So, uh, Nate Orchard has a chance. And remember, he also, all right, and don't discount this, he blocked a kick versus the Giants. You remember when Dwayne went down and shit was going downhill for us in that game? He blocks a kick that helps the Redskins get back into the game with Case Keenum. And if you remember, Keenum ends up, I think, quarterback sneaking in a touchdown or a bootlegging a, 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 a read option, a touchdown, whatever the case would be. I remember he had a rushing touchdown. That, I think, came off the heels of the blocked punt by uh, Nate Orchard. So Nate Orchard, not only a guy that can help you on defense, also gives you a little something on specials as well. Don't discount that and the importance of it either. So those are the three guys that I think are battling for potentially two or one spot. These next three guys are surefire locks on this football team. It's not, not a matter of if they're making a team. It's where they're going to play and how much are they going to play. You start with the elder statesman of the group, Ryan Kerrigan, the longest tenured Redskin, I believe, on the roster now. Um, when you look around, I don't think anyone's been here longer than Ryan Kerrigan. Uh, I think Trent Williams had that distinction initially, if I'm not mistaken, I think, uh, Williams came a year prior to Kerrigan, but he's no longer on the team. So I think by default now, Kerrigan is your longest tenured Washington Redskin. And um, I think he's still got something left in the tank. I really do. And I know last year was a very frustrating season for him. He had never missed a game, uh, rarely misses any snaps, let alone a game. And uh, last year he dealt with a concussion and he dealt with numerous injuries and um, it was just a frustrating year altogether for Kerrigan. And, you know, you listen to him talk on the Zoom call and, and you hear a guy that is motivated to come back and show people that um, he's not washed and that he belongs here. You know, there was a lot of talking. You know, you'd be, you'd be a fool to think that these players don't hear a lot of the noise that goes on, you know, outside of the building. And there was a lot of talk by people like you and me and people outside of this market about possibly trading Ryan Kerrigan, about his time being up in Washington. And, you know, there were some diehard fans that were like, hey, I love Kerrigan so much that I want to see him get a chance to win. It's not going to happen here. Trade him to a contender. Uh, there were people like me who were just like, hey, to hell with all that sentimental stuff. We got a chance to get some real value for him at the trade deadline. If we can flip Kerrigan for a two right now, do it. You know, and that would have been the most ideal thing because he ultimately ended up breaking down at the end of the season. But, you know, I was all on board when we heard teams like the Colts and the Ravens that were really interested. I don't know if they were going to give up a two. I think the best you fetch for, for Kerrigan uh, was a three. But I would have taken a three. I would have. I'm sorry. I know some of you may not agree with that. I would have taken a third-round pick for Ryan Kerrigan. But uh, that being said, at, at this point now, he's here. He's ours. I'm looking forward to seeing Ryan Kerrigan 2.0 in this new scheme and what that means for him. And, and really, more so than the scheme, I'm looking forward to seeing Ryan Kerrigan in this new role because this is going to be a reinvigorated Ryan Kerrigan and one that should be full of energy coming off the bench. Not one that's playing 60 snaps every game, but one that rather is playing you know, more like 25 snaps a game. And that Ryan Kerrigan should come off the bench ready to get 
to the quarterback, you know, and really create some problems. So I'm really looking forward to seeing Ryan Kerrigan in this new role because maybe a fresh Ryan Kerrigan is a dangerous Ryan Kerrigan. And who knows? Maybe Kerrigan's the guy that ends up with double-digit sacks and kind of jumps out of nowhere. And all of a sudden in the offseason, we're saying, hey, we got to bring Ryan Kerrigan back. There's no way we can let him leave after a dominant 12 and a half sack campaign because not all 12 and a half sack seasons are created equal. All right. There's the Ryan Kerrigan, you know, 12 and a half half sack season where you're like, oh, okay, um, two versus this backup. Another three in this one game versus this backup. You know, one here, a half a sack there. Another sack and a half against this backup on another team. But when we needed him the most, nothing. Crickets. And then there's a different type of impactful 12 and a half. Game on the line. You put all your pass rushers on the field and Kerrigan gets a game clinching sack. And he's doing the showstopper. All right. Or it's a crucial third down late in a ball game. Redskins need a stop to get the football back to have a chance to win and kick a game-winning field goal. And Kerrigan gets to the quarterback, gets the sack. They punt the football. Redskins ultimately get in the field goal range on a beautifully led game-winning drive by Dwayne Haskins. And D-Hop puts it through the uprights from 39 yards and the Redskins win in thrilling fashion. And you look back at that sack that Kerrigan had on third and eight that put this game away. And you say, okay, yeah, Kerrigan's doing the damn thing this year. So, I'm looking forward to seeing what Kerrigan does in this new role. And, and let's be honest, it's a contract year. If it's not here, it's somewhere, right? You want to get paid? You better produce at a high enough level that someone is willing to fork over the type of cash that you think you're worthy of moving forward. So um, not only is he looking to prove that he still got it, he's looking to prove that he deserves another payday from someone, if not here, elsewhere. Then you get to, of course, the two main attractions, the main event, the tag team back again, all right? But it's the first time around for these guys. And we start with the second year uh, guy in Montez Sweat, who I think a lot of us feel like is, is poised to take that step forward in uh, Jack Del Rio's system. And um, I think more so than Kerrigan, he might actually benefit from a 4-3 defensive scheme, you know? I didn't think he had a problem standing up in a two-point stance. Uh, but And he did it a lot at, at Mississippi State. But with his length and his quickness, um, you know, him with his hand in the dirt might actually not be a bad thing for him. We'll see what happens. But at the end of the day, I think we saw uh, signs of a guy that was starting to get it in Montez Sweat towards the end of the season. And it's that kind of confidence. And uh, we all, I talked about this before on the show, and you've heard guys that have played in the league tell you this too. It, it, there's not much difference between a lot of these guys in the league. There are a couple of big differences, though. You know, some guys are much more athletically gifted than others. We understand that. But if all things are equal, you know, with some of these players, and for a lot of these guys, things are equal. That guy's a great athlete. So is this guy. This guy's comparable, and, and they're all similar size, you know. Uh, there aren't many things that really separate them from a physical standpoint or an athleticism standpoint. So what's the biggest difference? And th that's when you start getting into the minutia of things. And, and, you know, technique is definitely one. But really, it, it comes down to two things. Your fit in a scheme, how someone uses you. Look, you can take one player and put him in seven different defenses and you may get seven different outputs from that guy. You know, he may be absolutely unblockable and dominant with these three teams over here. With these next two teams, he's all right. You know, not all that. Not a guy that really scares you, but he can put up some numbers. And then with these last two teams, he's absolutely horrible. And, and, it's, and it's the same player, but different schemes. And then the next thing is simply confidence. You know, that's one of the biggest differentiators in this game is confidence. This guy knows what he's capable of. This guy isn't quite sure. He's on the fence about what he's capable of. Doesn't have the same confidence that this guy has. Even though he may actually be more talented, this guy is more confident. And because of that confidence, he's able to go out and make plays. And so I think we started to see Montez Sweat doubt himself less and be a lot more confident towards the stretch 
run of the season. And I'm looking forward to seeing that guy start the year off instead of waiting before he picks things up. I'm looking forward to seeing that guy start the season and really produce some numbers. And um, I, again, I would not be shocked if Montez Sweat leads the way in 2020 in terms of a sack count uh, for the season. But, you know, I, I saw some crazy stuff out there uh, in terms of the next guy on this list. And of course, I saved what I perceived to be the best for last. And of course, the predator himself, Chase Young. Um, this is a guy that I, I saw on Twitter from somebody, you know, over under on 30 sacks his rookie season. I'm like, all right, all right, get out of here. All right, uh, seriously. But, you know, the sack record for a rookie is 15 and a half sacks. I'm not saying that that's um, within reach, but I'm not saying that it's out of reach either. You know, I don't think he's going to jump in and have 16 off the, off the bat, right out of the gate. You know, I would lose my mind if Chase Young comes into the league and had, because I haven't seen 15 in a Redskins uniform in my life. I, I've, I've never seen that with these two eyes. I've been dying to see something like that in a Redskins uniform. I've seen guys on other teams do that. And I've always said to myself, man, I want one of those. I'd like one of those. That would be really awesome to have one of those. I've seen other guys do it. Hell, Chandler Jones is doing it every year for the Arizona Cardinals. That must be a lot of fun. You know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had a guy, Shaq Barrett, who I wanted the Redskins to sign in free agency last year. He had 19 and a half sacks last year. I was like, man, that could have been us. If we had the foresight. $5 million is all it took to get you 19 and a half sacks last year. Who knew? I did. Damn it. But I digress. I want one of those. It may not come in 2020, okay? And I'm fine with that. I'm actually not looking for it. It'd be nice if it came, okay? But I'm not actually looking for that. What I am, however, looking for is signs of dominance. If I can just get that, I will leave 2020 a happy man knowing what's to come is going to be pretty damn nasty for the rest of the NFC East and really the rest of the NFL in general. I just need to see signs and flashes of dominance in 2020, you know? And ultimately, if he shows enough of them, he will be double teamed. He will get chipped. The good ones still find ways to bag quarterbacks, but he's a young guy and he'll have to adjust. And remember last year at Ohio State towards the end of the season. What happened? He got held. He got double teamed. He even got triple teamed. I showed you the film on him getting triple teamed in, in the Big Ten Championship game versus Wisconsin. Teams weren't going to allow Chase Young to beat them. If he comes in the league and starts wrecking shop, teams are not going to allow him to beat them. So he's going to have to learn what Von Miller, what Khalil Mack, what Chandler Jones and the elite rushers in this league have learned to do. And that's learn how to still get to the quarterback getting chipped and getting double teamed. There are ways. It's harder. It's a lot tougher. Ask Aaron Donald. All right. There are plays where three guys are assigned to Aaron Donald. And I, I can tell you countless times watching the Rams over the years, he's getting double teamed and he's still winning and he's still applying pressure consistently through a double team. If you want it bad enough, you can get there. I think Chase Young will eventually evolve into a guy that will be able to destroy doubles as well, but I don't think he's there yet. So I just want to see flashes of brilliance of dominance. If I get that in year number one, I'm going to be a happy man. Anything else I get is going to be icing on the cake. But I just want to see if, if, if this is an eight and a half sack season, but there is a three sack game in there and you saw the dominance. And then for the rest of the season, team said, no, 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 that won't be us. And, and we start seeing a steady diet of doubles and and, 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 and in certain cases, triples where he might get chipped on the way out, two and a half blockers assigned to him. I'll be okay with that because I know it's there. And eventually he'll figure out 
how to get around because I keep telling you guys this because some of you, if Chase Young doesn't come out of the gate with 12 and a half, you're going to be like, oh my God, this guy's a bust. Some of you are crazy like that, all right? Some of you use the B word way too casually, all right? Bottom line is, Khalil Mack had four and a half sacks his rookie season. It doesn't always happen right off the bat, okay? So understand that it could be a, a 10 sack season, it could be a six sack season, it could be a 16 sack season, all right? It's going to range somewhere in between those two numbers, I think. Anywhere from six to 16 sacks in his rookie season, all right? It's very doable. I don't see it happening, but, um, you know, I think that number is going to be somewhere around 8 to 10 when it's all said and done. And I'm okay with that. I just need to see the dominance, the flashes of brilliance that lets me know that this guy is legit. But sky's the limit for this group here. And ultimately, if you're keeping four, those four guys are probably more likely than not going to be um, uh, um, Chase Young, Montez Sweat, Ryan Kerrigan, and one of, of two guys, I believe. It's either going to be Jordan Brailford or Nate Orchard if it's four. If it's five, I think Nate Orchard is definitely in as your fourth. And then you become, you have a battle between the two seventh rounders of the last two years and uh, James Smith-Williams and uh, Jordan Brailford and which one of those guys impresses the most in camp and into the preseason and ultimately into the regular season is going to end up being your fifth and final edge rusher. But if they go with four, I think it's a battle between Orchard and Jordan Brailford. But again, do not discount James Williams, Smith-Williams because they drafted him this year. But if you ask me, you're more likely to see James Smith Williams be able to be released, clear waivers, and the Redskins stash him on the practice squad than uh, Jordan Brailford. You know what I'm saying? So I think the Redskins are cognizant of that. And worst case scenario, a lot of times it's not necessarily the best guy that gets kept on the roster. or It's usually the guy that you think you can sneak through to the practice squad. This other guy may actually deserve the roster spot better, but... To you, uh, in, in, on the outside looking in, if you look at it from an outside perspective, you're thinking to yourself, nobody knows what this guy's been doing in practice all, all off season. They don't know what we've seen. If we stick this guy on waivers, no one's picking him up, even though he's been the more productive guy. We don't expect him to produce for us right now. So we can stick him on the practice squad, and when we need him, we can snatch him up. Now, if we release this other guy, there are a lot of teams that wanted him in the draft, and we just got to him first as a six-round pick. If we cut ties with him, someone else is going to snatch him up. And so we probably should keep this six-rounder and allow this other guy to hit the practice squad, even though he was the more productive of the two in camp. So sometimes it's a situation like that where a guy ends up making a roster where the other guy might have been more deserving. So I think that's the situation you run into with maybe a James Smith-Williams where you're like, nobody's snatching James Smith-Williams up if he gets cut. And and the Redskins want to put him on the uh, practice squad, nobody's going to touch him, you know. And, and so you, you'll get him, you know, you'll get him back. So uh, those are your defensive ends, man, and I'm excited about this group. Maybe as excited about this group as any um, on this team going into the 2020 season. And I'm really, I'm really excited about the receivers. I am. I, I know people have been trashing our receivers. They don't think they're very good. I know a lot of people understand that they're young, but they don't think... We think they're young and talented. Everyone else thinks they're young and terrible, and there's a big difference. For me, I'm excited about the receivers, but I, I don't think I'm more excited for any positional group than these defensive ends. I'm excited about the defensive tackles. I'm not more excited about them than the defensive ends, though. This is the group that I'm most excited to see, and I can't wait. Bart Scott can't wait. So... Louis.